Uh, thank you all for coming. This is Reactive Data Log for Datomic. Uh, Rich Hickey, in his talk, Deconstructing the Database, one of the earlier talks introducing Datomic, uh, says, we want to make reactive systems that don't pull, and we want those systems to get a consistent view of the world. So it will be my thankless task today of convincing a room full of closure aficionados uh, to do as Rich Hickey says. Uh, and me, that is Nicholas Goebel, uh, I'm a software consultant at Clockworks. We specialize in data infrastructure, web development, uh, and I'm also a graduate student at ETH Zurich, where I do research on precisely the kinds of systems that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and this work is the result of an ongoing collaboration with Frank McSherry, uh, my research advisor at ETH, and two of my colleagues at Clockworks, Malte and David, who are sitting amongst you. So, what are reactive systems? Uh, I will definitely not define reactive in public or even try to do anything like that. I think suffice to say, you know it when you see it. You know it with uh, things like live updating web applications, you know it with uh, alerting systems, real-time dashboards, and more generally, with everything that, anything that looks like a stream processor or like a rule engine. What I will say is that all these systems share the interesting property that data coordinates code and not the other way around. So the arrival of new data causes computation to happen. You don't, uh, maybe at some regular interval, uh, you start collecting data and preparing it and doing some computation on it, rather the other way around. Data arrives and it might trigger computation or it might not. So uh, Nikita Prokopov, the author of uh, DataScript and RUM, uh, had a widely circulated blog post called The Web After Tomorrow uh, where he lays out a uh, possible architecture for the web apps of tomorrow, the life updating web applications uh, of tomorrow. Uh, and in that we start with an unbounded source of all the data in our system, a constant stream of accumulations and retractions from which we successively derive more and more refined views up to every individual user potentially. So for example, uh, when we start with the set of all facts that our system knows about, for every individual user, we might start uh, deriving the set of data, the subset of that data that is accessible to that user. And from that on, we, through further aggregation, filtering, slicing, dicing, whatever, uh, we arrive at the very small subset of all data that a user is currently looking at in their browser. And of course, we want this uh, derivation to stay in sync as new data arrives. So for example, once I'm at my browser session and I'm looking at data and I lose my access rights for what I'm currently looking at, uh, there's nothing we can do from a security standpoint, but still we want the UI to reflect uh, what, the system, what the system's current state is. Same thing goes for when the user starts selecting uh, new filters and wants an updated view of a different part of the world, we want that to uh, update as close to as real time as possible. Um, so again, data coordinates code in the system we're not talking so much about running a query against the database. We're moving towards something where we subscribe to a query and receive changes uh, whenever the output should change, corresponding to some new data that has been transacted from some place at the other end of the world, possibly. And the, the other thing that we want to change is um, that we don't want to rerun computations from scratch uh, in order to incorporate changes. First of all, because we don't always know when something has changed under our feet but also because it's uh, inefficient to do so. So we want changes to propagate down to every consumer in our system, to every consumer of the data, down to every individual user in a web browser. And of course, we have a lingua franca for <laughs> describing these things, so we'd, we'd like to describe these things as declaratively as possible, and Datalog, I think, is a, is a, for, for many reasons, uh, is, a, is a great solution for that. Uh, and so to make this work, what we kind of have to do is have this big hierarchical uh, data log derivation uh, and kind of put it onto a stream processor because again, it can't exactly run as uh, data log engines of today run. It has to work in a slightly different way. It has to kind of run in reverse. Data has to coordinate the code. So we'll be looking at a more concrete example of this where the domain we're working in will be persons, persons issuing loans to each other. Uh, and these persons are associated with branches of a bank and we have a hierarchical structuring between these branches um, and uh, in what branch a, person, a person's account is registered will have implications about whether we can access it or not. 
And based on this data, we want to first derive a set of users that have opted into us using their data for some analysis, and also the kinds of users that we have access to given our uh, read permissions for this system. And we'll add another derivation step on top of that, where we accumulate some, uh, where we aggregate some statistics or so something like uh, the total debt per user. And then we imagine there's uh, a user, like an account manager, sitting at some interactive session uh, looking at the total uh, amount receivable for one of uh, her clients. Uh, and that will be another query on top of this derived data. And uh, pray for this live demo, please. Um, so you, you won't know exactly what, it, what this means right now. Just, uh, I'll explain it later. I will just uh, start. Uh, I will post my passwords in public. And then I will start this mysterious server. We don't know what it does yet. We just started. And we switch into the REPL. Uh, what we do here is uh, we represent the same schema in a very kind of datomic fashion uh, that I just described about. So we'll have a notion of system time in some abstract units of, uh, of days. Uh, we'll have permissions indicating read access. We'll have these branches uh, which hold accounts and which can be subsidies of one another. We have loans that are associated with an amount, a uh, person that has issued the, uh, the loan, a person, person that was granted the loan, and they're associated with a payday in system time by which the loan becomes due. And finally, we have persons. Persons just have names and a flag indicating whether they have clicked the little uh, GDPR thing and uh, have allowed us to, to actually use their computation in here. So we'll have some entities that we want to talk explicitly about and keep track of their IDs. And we start um, at system time one, at day one, and with two branches, a parent branch and a child branch, and with three, uh, three users. Two of them have opted into um, the data collection, and one hasn't yet. But all users are part of the same uh, child branch uh, of our bank. For this child branch, we have a read permission initially, uh, and we have two initial loans. By the way, can you see the, the REPL code fine? Uh, good. Yeah. Just cry out when, when that stops being true. Um, so we have uh, two loans initially that have been due at system day zero, so yesterday. Uh, and uh, both were issued by the same user. Uh, two different users, um, and those, those exist at the beginning of time. So we also define a data log rule indicating uh, when we consider a, a loan to be due. Uh, I think, I hope most of you are, have at least seen something similar like this. Uh, but in this case, we just say, okay, a loan has a payday. Uh, and whenever this payday, uh, whenever the system time is in advance of this payday, we consider this loan to be due. Um, what we do now is we connect to this mysterious server that we've been starting before. And whenever I do something called transact here in this demo, I want you to imagine that this is like new data arriving in the system. This is not actually the user in the browser transacting new data. This is like just so I can simulate for you the arrival of new data. So initially, the initial data arrives. Nothing happens. No one is interested in that. Uh, what we do now is something, again, it looks a bit like we use something like Datomic but it moves the way we talk about it from running a query or executing a query to registering a query. Um, and this query will have a globally uh, valid name called ConchBank, the name of our fake bank, ConchBank opt-ins. And what this query will do is uh, it will simply look for persons who have opted into data collection, and it will check whether we have read access onto the branch that this person's account belongs to. For read access, we'll use another simple recursive data log rule uh, that um, simply checks whether we have a direct permission on this branch or we have a read permission for any of the parent branches of this branch. Um, so what we do here is we register this query and we receive an initial result set that looks a lot like uh, what you'd expect from Datomic. We see uh, resulting tuples, uh, the user with the ID 1 called Mabel, user with the ID 2 called Dipper, we get something that is uh, maybe in addition to a result set of, of Datomic indicating a multiplicity of this result. So in this case, we get one version of these two uh, results tuples and we get a timestamp. So the snapshot of the database at which these results were derived, in this case, both at zero, which makes sense because this was the first transaction. Now what we do, uh, we simulate uh, that someone uh, retracts uh, our access rights for this child branch. Once that happens, uh, we automatically um, 
get an update here for the, can you still see that if I zoom that out? Great. Uh, we get an automatic update for this opt-ins collection without re-evaluating anything, indicating that now the results are the same, but the multiplicities are negative, indicating that we are to retract those uh, results from whatever state we might be maintaining based on this view. And also the timestamp, of course, has been updated uh, to one. So again, now uh, we lost our access rights for the child branch, but we gain it for the parent branch, so we expect this recursive rule to kick in. And of course, we uh, get the same results we got before, just at timestamp two now, with multiplicity one indicating, haha, we uh, still, uh, we again have access to these, uh, these two users. A note that the third user is still missing because he hasn't opted in to all of this yet. Okay, so now I said uh, we want to derive something from that. And for that, we need the global name that we registered this query under. Uh, so within this uh, new query called conchbank debts, uh, we will use the opt-ins relation and filter it down uh, or, or join it with all of the loans and uh, collect all of the loans for each of the persons that has opted in, uh, uh, check whether the loan is due by the rule I've defined above, and sum all of these amounts together uh, to arrive at something like this, where we see, okay, Dipper at, uh, system time, uh, at the database snapshot two has total debts of 75. Again, Suze, the other user, is missing in this example because he hasn't opted in yet. And finally, we imagine an account manager on an interactive session, which is why we assign like a throwaway namespace for this, uh, who is also interested in the persons that we actually have access to. Uh, and the loans they have received from a person from the uh, user Mabel, and we sum those together, and we uh, we see okay, so the total amount of money owed to Mabel is 75, which makes sense because Dipper is the only one uh, with uh, outstanding debts here. So now, what happens if I learn how to navigate this? Uh, so we simulate that Suze finally goes on, and uh, we keep nagging him with emails, and uh, he finally opts in. Uh, so we transact the fact that Suze now uh, is a person who also has opted in, and we receive uh, automatic updates for all of the queries, and not only for the base queries, but also all of the derived ones. So we see there is a new relation, in, a new tuple in the opt-ins relation, so we don't get all of the relation, we only get the addition that we're supposed uh, to, to um, reconcile with whatever state we've been maintaining locally. Uh, and we also get uh, updates like that for the receivables not, uh, relation, where we're told that we're supposed to retract the old result of 75, the old sum, and update it by a new one, which is the sum 125 uh, at time sum three. Uh, and uh, the total debts also gets a new uh, tuple for Suze. And also I want you to notice that it is not by chance that uh, these things all arrive at the same time, and even if they weren't, uh, you'd still be able to get a consistent view of those because, you, because they all share the same uh, timestamp. Okay, so um, finally, two other loans arrive, but they're not due yet. They're due at day five, which is in the future of, of system time. So once I transact those, we don't expect anything to change, and rightly so, nothing changes until we uh, advance system time. Let me make this more readable. Until we advance system time to day six, where we uh, expect the corresponding updates to show. So I hope this kind of makes clear what this reactive uh, way of evaluating data log uh, is all about. Okay, and the demo worked, nice. Okay, let me take a sip of water. <laughs> hmm. So, what you've just seen uh, is a system called 3DF. Uh, we've been developing that for uh, the better part of this year now. Uh, what it does, it does reactive data log evaluation in the sense that I just saw, uh, showed you uh, on top of a distributed data parallel stream processor. It feeds uh, from durable data sources, so it doesn't feed from a user transacting tuples all the time via REPL, that was just me demoing it. It feeds from something like Datomic uh, or even multiple Datomic instances or any other kind of source that knows how to provide tuples in a kind of um, transaction loggy way. And the important thing is it propagates only changes. So we uh, work under the hypothesis that we usually have quite a lot of data in the overall system, but the things a user might actively be interested in or that a downstream consuming service might actively be interested in are a rather small subset of that. Uh, so these things are available on GitHub. I'll say something about that later. It's not like production-grade software, but you can check it out and replicate the kind of things I showed you. 
So uh, to drive this point home, this is not a database. This is supposed to sit on top of a database. Uh, so as you can see here, we have uh, Datomic, for example, as the source of truth. And Datomic, as you know, or might, might know, provides this very nice reactive way, way of um, subscribing to all of the transactions happening on uh, the database. Uh, so we do exactly that. And we run a small distributed uh, cluster of these um, 3DF workers in front of that, which read from Datomic and uh, update uh, all of these computations. External users, other services can, uh, first of all, of course, transact data to D Datomic in the way they did uh, before. But they can now uh, send data log queries in the way I showed you to this cluster, uh, have them being turned into uh, query plans, which are then a bit optimized and registered. Uh, and then uh, they will start receiving output changes whenever uh, new data is read from Datomic. So it is not a database, but it's also not just like a, a, a toy program. It's, it's a proper stream processor, and I will explain how it works in a second. To first approximation, um, to get this data coordinates code-like uh, feeling, these semantics, we need this to work like a stream processor, not like a query engine. So this is definitely a requirement for us. The second thing is we want this to be transparent in the sense that we don't want to change how we write data log queries to accommodate for the various ways in which they can change. And finally, we want to do something that I actually didn't know at the beginning of this year but was considered almost impossible until a couple of months ago, uh, no, a couple, sorry, a couple of years ago, that uh, uh, reactive iteration, so reacting to iterative computations with, in the face of arbitrary retractions, uh, we wanted that as well because da uh, data log uh, derives a very interesting power from the ability to define recursive rules and mutually recursive rules, and we wanted to preserve that. So, um, back off a bit. As every closure programmer already knows, uh, this is how you compute with persistent collections. You have a database collection at timestamp zero. You perform some computation on it. In this case, you evaluate a query, and you end up with a results collection at timestamp T0. In the incremental setting, so the kind of change propagation setting that we want to move to, uh, we still have a database snapshot, and we have a transaction at uh, timestamp one, and we kind of need a different style of operator. We need the modified operator, I'll call it delta query here, that uh, gives us the exact set of changes that are required, uh, the delta results at T1, to take the old, the previous result set that we got from, uh, from the initial, in, initial query results to take them to the updated query result at uh, timestamp one. So this is precisely what I just shown you. We want to get changes only, and we can add those changes to any other derived views if we so care. We can update uh, some, some visualization in the browser, uh, or we can just look at the changes and analyze the changes uh, in isolation. Uh, so a naive implementation of the uh, delta query operator is also at hand because you can just apply the transaction work with the database before and the database after, evaluate the query in the traditional way, and simply subtract what you got uh, at, the, uh, at time one from what you got at time zero, and you end up with precisely these semantics. Of course, while this gives you the semantics, it doesn't give you the performance characteristics that we expect of incremental uh, evaluation. If we look at transparency, uh, this is a, a, another setting where we're considering devices that start deviating from uh, the speed settings they're supposed to follow. Uh, you can read this statically. So if we have a database of sensor readings and speed settings, we can get all of the devices uh, that are deviating. But uh, it gains another time-dependent reading once you start evaluating uh, reactively, and that is kind of like a rule. We want, to, we want to be notified whenever a device starts deviating from its speed. And also, Note that we're not uh, saying anything about the source of this change. Uh, so whether the, the deviation can uh, uh, originate from a change in settings or a change in device speed, as reported by a, a sensor, we're not saying anything about that. Contrast this with a query like that, which you can write in Datomic today, uh, which um, makes it explicit that we're working both with a database and a transaction here, and uh, we're, where we explicitly looking only at the transaction to consider changes in device speed. This is very nice, this works, and if you do this a bit carefully with clause order and everything, uh, you can get the, mostly the performance characteristics of incremental computation that you'd expect, but uh, you have to write separate queries, one for the initial result and one for every source of change uh, that you might experience. And this problem compounds once you start using these results in derived computation, because then you kind of have to 
get the results from all of these uh, different versions of the query that are supposed to fill the same logical collection. Okay, and reactive iteration messes this up even further because now, if you recall the incremental computation scheme from a couple of slides ago, uh, we need some kind of state to begin with. We have some state and we have some changes and we apply these changes efficiently to derive the output changes. In an iterative setting, this kind of gets messed up because we cannot distinguish between changes that were caused by new inputs, so for example, a new transaction from Datomic, and uh, changes that were caused by an iterative computation firing, at least if we want to do it uh, kind of concurrently. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, at, at this point, you kind of, you give up, basically, unless you happen to be at ETH, where a person named Frank McSherry, uh, turns out he has solved, uh, he and his team back at Microsoft Research, they have thought about this reactive iteration problem quite a bit, and they actually solved it in an interesting system called Nayad, uh, which was released quite a few years ago. And differential data flow is a complete re-implementation of that system by Frank. Uh, it's written entirely in Rust. Uh, and what it does is it's a data parallel programming framework designed to quickly respond to arbitrary changes in input. So sounds like kind of what we need. And it is uh, a, dis a distributed system. So it gives us the kinds of in interesting performance characteristics that we're looking for there. It's also available freely on GitHub and I yeah, uh, would heavily recommend checking it out. Um, at its heart, differential data flow manages persistent multi-sets so this should also be very unsurprising if you've uh, looked at how Datomic stores data. Uh, we represent a logical collection of edges as a sequence of additions and retractions that accumulate at various logical timestamps to the logical view of the collection. So for example, at timestamp T0, uh, we have a set containing the edges A, B, and C, D. And at time T1, we have the set containing the edges A, B, C, E. But the change from C, the, the retraction of CD and the addition of CE is uh, still uh, represented as part of the collection. Now, what, you, um, what we're looking at here is in, if, you, if you think about how to make this, um, how to do a computation like that, do iterative computations like that, if we have a transaction T1 that causes an iterative computation, a recursive computation to kick off, we have a problem because we kind of have to sequentialize what we're doing here. So we're going sideways through time, uh, starting at T0, going to T1, doing an iterative computation until things stop changing, and only then can we continue processing new transactions. Um, and this seems, if we want to do it in a consistent way, this seems like the only way uh, that's safe to do. So this is where differential data flows, uh, data modeling, uh, starts deviating from what Datomic does and what almost any other system does. Because in differential data flow, logical times can have more than one dimension in a sense that for this specific case where, we, for example, we're computing with these edges, we're computing uh, a breadth first search starting at uh, node A, and uh, we can represent um, the timestamps by pairs, one position indicating the transaction time and the other indicating a iteration, a loop iteration um, counter. So in this case, at T1, uh, when an uh, iterative computation starts, we can finally give those things interesting timestamps. We can say T10, T11, T12, etc. Uh, and so we kind of took this sequential thing and um, inter interleaved it. Uh, to make this correct, we now have to use a partial order of times instead of a total order uh, to maintain the consistency of this approach. So the partial order in this case will be a product partial order that ensures that in the derivation of the second loop iteration uh, at T1, uh, we don't make use of, uh, the, of any transactions after T1, even though they might already be um, um, present physically in the system. S likewise, uh, in the derivation of the state of the collection at T20, we cannot make use of those iterative computations before, because, first of all, they might still be in progress, uh, and they might still be retracted by things afterwards, as, and it, the timestamps don't allow us to. Now, the interesting part is once we start catching up uh, to, to get the actual new value, the next value of the collection, once we start catching up, we only ever have to reconcile um, the changes that happened in the next transaction, so in transaction two, with the changes that were introduced in the loop iterations before. So we don't have to recompute everything from scratch, even though we have arbitrary retractions here. We only have to look at the accumulated changes uh, in all of the states visible from, uh, that the partial order tells us is visible. So in this case, um, we retract CD, which means we don't have to do anything in this state, 
Because uh, AC, the edge introduced in the previous uh, transaction, is still reachable from A, because we can go AB and then BC, and AC is still a valid result. Not so much once we start reconciling with the second loop iteration, because here, transaction one, the iterative computation back at transaction one told us, oh yeah, AD is part of the uh, result set, which is not true anymore, because CD, the edge CD was retracted. So here, we have to um, fix that, such that the accumulated collection here uh, is, is a valid view of the world. So, this solves the reactive iteration problem. There is more to it, but uh, it solves the reactive iteration problem for this sketch at least, because uh, we can give sensible timestamps to all of the uh, places in the data flow uh, using these, these pairs. More importantly for users, uh, differential data flow looks more like uh, the kind of functional programs that you'd write in any other language. Uh, it gives you these operators, map, joins, concatenations, group bys, and it gives you the iterate that we just talked about. And notice how this uh, satisfies the transparency uh, requirement that we had earlier in the sense that we're not saying anything about uh, how the results of this computation can change, but they will be updated efficiently uh, whether edges changes or whether new nodes are introduced. Okay, so at the heart of it, uh, 3DF is simply a data log compiler that um, dynamically compiles data log expressions to these kinds of differential data flows. Um, so after this, live updating web applications is, uh, can be considered a solved problem, I think. Uh, and uh, what remains to see is like, the, I think the generalization aspect of this is also quite visible because, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we render results into the REPL or whether we render them into an email or into a dashboard or whatever. Um, the, the principle is the same uh, and, and especially stateful representations of uh, the, the computational results benefit from this approach. So if you have something like D3 and you um, uh, render a bunch of bars, bars uh, you don't want to start re-rendering everything all the time uh, when new data is introduced. You simply want to change the height of this bar, uh, change the height of the other bar, and update your computation as you go. And uh, my colleague David has, has a blog post out on, on how to do this uh, with 3DF and differential data flows and data log and uh, D3 or Vega. Uh, also in uh, reality, of course, um, the illusion of a single source of truth is already just that. It's an illusion in the sense that we might be working with multiple databases. We might be working with external services that we source data from. Uh, for example, the, the most trivial one would be yeah, we have uh, a datomic database for many microservices in our system. And uh, uh, 3DF, because of its distributed nature, can help you build this illusion of a single big pile of uh, datums that you can query um, uh, just as you would uh, an individual database with the, uh, while benefiting from the distribution, of course. Uh, Datomic, of course, can also query across multiple databases, but their uh, queries are limited to a single peer, and here we can use whatever uh, machines we have available in this 3DF cluster. So, yeah, this brings me to notes on performance. Uh, of course, incremental computation as a, as a concept uh, is interesting because it kind of uh, pegs the system load uh, onto the rate of change in the system, uh, and so you don't update your computations uh, when, when users are polling you, and when you have lots of users who are interested in like sub-second updates or, it, or updates every couple of seconds, this can be quite heavy. So if that is what your uh, load characteristics look like, incremental computation can be very interesting to uh, subvert that. Then as I said, because this is distributed, we are not limited to a single peer for complex queries. So for anything you might be using, uh, you might be reaching to Spark now because maybe uh, it, it's beyond the capability of a single datomic peer. You could in principle just express it in, take the same query and run it on top of 3DF and uh, benefit from a cluster and a cluster that uh, will be slightly more efficient than Spark at that. Um, and uh, timestamps in this computation, so the kind of streaming computations that we're doing here, uh, they support nanosecond precision. You don't need any kind of windowing. Things will just update uh, when additions and retractions arrive in our system. And for all of the special cases, more complex algorithms where data log maybe is not expressive enough uh, to capture them, uh, you can drop down in, uh, into the scary world of Rust and write a differential data flow and integrate that with the same kind of uh, named collections interface that I've shown you in the demo. So uh, we're still working on this. Uh, so the, the biggest point is here is getting the scalability and also the performance isolation between users who can issue arbitrary data log queries onto this. 
uh, to um, hold for, for large numbers of concurrent queries. There's, there's some interesting uh, things to do there. And we're also looking at bulletproofing. We have a datomic integration. I haven't shown you yet. I can show later. But uh, we're working on bulletproofing that. Uh, and we're working in general towards like a better release of that, uh, this system. And yeah, we're quite excited to use it for our own projects. We use Clojure all the time. And maybe you are too. OK, so we want to make reactive systems that don't pull. Mm. And we don't, don't just want to tr throw away all consistency guarantees. We want correct results. Uh, so if this is a problem that kind of uh, occurs to you, if that is a thing that you're interested in, uh, then 3DF, I think, is interesting because it lets, le lets you leverage data log in the same way as you did for Datomic to build reactive systems and distributed stream processing jobs. Uh, it lets you scale queries beyond the limits of a single peer in the way I discussed. Uh, and it lets you continue using Datomic for all of the nice datomic -y things that it does. Uh, and uh, if at any point you do need more hand-built uh, streaming computations, uh, you can integrate them and start using the nicer interface of data log as soon as possible or have specialists implement very hand-optimized data, data flows and use them uh, interactively from your REPL. So if you're interested in this, uh, we are always interested in hearing about people who have like, these kinds of problems and who are interested in this approach. And we're talking to a couple of people and are always happy to talk to more. So uh, let us know, and uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are questions, please ask them now. <laughs>